You're listening to AM 1220, The Word. I'm John Lofton. This is Living the Word. And since 1933, the Navigators have been introducing Jesus to those who don't know him and helping those who do know Jesus deepen their relationship with him. And they train others to continue this discipleship wherever they live, work, and play. Today, Navigators serve in more than 100 countries, and among those countries is Thailand, where the predominant religion is Buddhism, but there's a strong undercurrent of Hinduism. One of the Navigators who served there with his family for years is my guest today, Justin Gravitt. These days, you can find Justin in Dayton, Ohio, training pastors and church leaders on disciple-making. Why? Because Justin and his regional team have discovered that pastors and churches are hungry for help in the area of personal disciple-making. And Justin, thanks for being with me this morning. Appreciate your being here. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. So you have your fingers in a couple of new pies, and I have known you at least through the Navigators for a number of years through journeys through Thailand and even beginning with your college days at Miami University. So a long history, but we just haven't talked often enough, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. So let me ask you to begin, if you will, about your experiences in Thailand, and then we'll spend the gist of our conversation about the way you're discipling in Dayton. Okay, sounds good. So, what brought you to Thailand? You, your wife, your family. I mean, a strange place. I know by good fortune, Thailand is one country where uh, religion is accepted. You can be anything and you're not persecuted, but it was kind of, it had to have been difficult. I mean, language barriers, culture barriers. Tell us about your experience. Yeah. So my story with Thailand began in uh, 1999. It was between my junior and senior year of college at Miami University. And uh, the guy who was discipling me was leading a trip to Russia and invited me to go with him. And uh, I was not at all interested in missions or Russia. And so I politely declined. And he said, well, why don't you just pray about, you know, what you're going to do this summer uh, if you're going to just go back to uh, your hometown, or, you know, is God calling you to do something else? And there was a list of mission trips that he had given me, and and so I looked over that, and I began to pray. And at that point in my life, um, I'd never raised money to do anything uh, missions-oriented, and I wanted to work the first half of the summer. And so I made a very spiritual decision after looking at the trips to uh, to go to Thailand. I felt like God was calling me to go somewhere. And Thailand was one of the cheaper trips, so I wouldn't have to raise a lot of money. And it was the second half of the summer. And uh, so decided to go to that one. And um, as I prepared, I just really felt like God opening doors up. Uh, the funding went really, really smoothly for me. And then I was in country in Thailand the first time that summer for about six weeks. And over that six weeks, God just really, really changed my heart. Uh, towards missions in general, I began to have a, a vision for my life and really felt like God was calling me uh, to minister to the Thai people. And so I came back and finished up at Miami and actually applied at that point to go over and be a missionary in Thailand with the Navigators. And the missionary and his family that I was going to be trained by there, um, his wife had a reoccurrence of cancer and they needed to come back. So I felt like God was shutting that door at that time, but he always kept it on my heart to, to be there and to minister to, to the ties. So from 99 until 09, essentially, um, I was moving in that direction. I would go back uh, for those summer trips maybe every other year, uh, either going as a part of a team or leading a team later on. And things just kind of opened up there in 09 and 10. I'd been married. We had uh, our oldest daughter, Elise, was eight months old when we decided that it was time for us to go. So moved there and uh, and began our work. And there's a lot, of, a lot that I could share. But uh, initially, we were going to go over and manage an Apple computer store uh, that was going to be opening up in a small town called Lampang which is about an hour, hour and a half outside of Chiang Mai, Thailand in the north. And once we got there, uh, we had a visa trouble. Uh, basically, the, the guy who owned the, the store 
didn't realize how much it would impact his tax status and different things across all his uh, franchises. And he said, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to get you a visa. So we were already on the ground <laughs> at this time, had sold everything, moved over with just our suitcases and our eight-month-old daughter, and now we had to figure out a way to get, get a visa. Um, so uh, from there... Wow. Yes. <laughs> right? that's, uh, that's a challenge. Yes. But, uh, you know, God overcomes all of it. So obviously he did. He did. He did. So I ended up teaching uh, English at an elementary school for the, the time that we were there and became the, the lead of the program and really began to, to be the liaison between the Thai teachers and the foreign teachers, develop trust with them. And kind of our mission when we were there is to reach out to, to the average Thai person. There are a lot of mission agencies in Thailand. Relatively few of them are actively trying to engage the, the average Thai um, Thailand's in a place where the countries surrounding it are kind of closed off to missionaries and so a lot of people go there and then kind of reach out to Burma or to Laos or to China uh, while they're in Thailand uh, but we really had a heart for the the central Thai and so our mission was to reach out to them so we moved into a house in a neighborhood Thai neighborhood and uh, in our city we were the only only foreign family there that we saw and that's what our friends told us and so um, we were very much uh, kind of immersed in the Thai, Thai community so mm -hmm. well how did you navigate there if you didn't speak Thai because I I'm guessing that you didn't go in with the knowledge of the language yeah we our Thai was pretty bad uh, going in so from my experience in and out of Thailand over the previous 10 years I was able to do like really cursory conversations. So, um, how you doing? How are things going? I can do numbers and colors and stuff like that. But outside of that, it was difficult. We really prayed for months um, prior to moving for a few specific things. One was that he would connect us with a family who could do some English uh, so that at the beginning we could communicate and learn and that that family would be helpful to us. We also ask God for a house with three bedrooms and a yard, which are all things that are not that common over there. And um, within the first month that we were there, uh, we found this house that had a yard in it and three bedrooms. It was perfect, just what we've been praying for. And the first night we were in the house, we went out uh, to get something to eat at this restaurant directly across the street. And it was run by this family, a Thai family, who um, the husband had been to Australia for about a year. And so he could speak English. And so just seeing the way that God answered those prayers. So that family really became uh, really close to us. And we leaned on them a lot uh, through our time there. But uh, yeah, so that was the, the beginning steps, the first steps in our time there was just uh, learning the language and trying to make contacts and developing relationships within the neighborhood. Mm. So you were serving as a teacher at the time. I was. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in a in a in a Thai school, I mean, you said yes. there were no other English speakers there, so it must have been, uh, you know, some place that where kids or the parents of kids wanted them to learn English. Yeah, it was actually a Thai government school. Um, so it was the way the school system works there is a little different. It's not based on where you live. It's based on kind of money, unless you, um, are going to go to the government school, which are a little less, um, a little less well-known, a little less reputable. But when I, when we changed our plan from being managing an Apple computer store to teaching, it was the middle of the school year. So I went around to different schools and basically said, Hey, do you need an English teacher? And finally found this school that said, yeah, you know, we could use you. And so I started there um, my first day, which I thought was an interview. I thought I was going back for an interview. And the teacher, one mm -hmm. of the head teachers said to me, okay, come with me. She took me to a first grade classroom with about 40 kids in it and said, okay, you will teach here. As in now, <laughs> you, you, you will teach now. <laughs> and uh, I had no experience teaching little kids. Um, so, you know, start out trying to assess 
their language ability, what's your name, nothing, um, stand up, sit down, nothing. I mean, we were at square one, and that was probably one of the And you were doing this in Thai, obviously. You were, you were speaking Thai to these... No, so I'm I'm there to teach them English. So I'm teaching them English and asking them their name in English and asking them to stand up or sit down in English and just blank looks. I mean, we were at square one as far as their English language capability. And uh, so that was a very long hour for me to fill. Um, and then after that, she came back and took me to another classroom. Same thing. Okay, you'll teach here. And so I drew on my, my hour of experience there and... Uh, and got through that. But that's kind of how it began at the school there. Um, so my job the first year was to teach English to all the first grade classrooms, which there were about five classrooms of 40 kids each. And then subsequently after that year, I moved into what they had called an English program, where I was teaching math, English, science, and health, all in English to first graders. And so when the, the goal was to be immersive. So I used a little bit of Thai in the classroom, but, but as little as I could get away with so that the kids could, could absorb the English. Wow. So how did, were, were first graders, I, I want to talk about your mission work, but I'm fascinated by this. Uh, how were the first graders, were they able to understand you? I mean, did you, did you use pantomime when you wanted them to stand up or sit down? Yeah, initially, yeah, that's kind of how it worked. A lot of uh, modeling and examples, uh, but kids learn fast. And so, you know, by the end of the first grade year, uh, the kids were able to read a little bit, you know, small words, two, three, four, wor four letter words, and uh, they're able to write and communicate uh, in, in small ways. So surfacey conversations, letters, numbers, you know, all that sort of thing. So uh, it was it was a really really great experience um, to be able to be at the school and engage with them and also with the teachers and the parents. So, mm. well, and were and none of the teachers spoke English either. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Yep. Wow. I see. How how did you do? How did you conduct an interview? And when all you spoke was English and all they spoke was Thai. Yeah. So, I mean, they had broken English. <laughs> they had broken... So their their English was about as good as my Thai normally. And uh, so uh, I, we were able to, to, to get through that language barrier. Um, but it was it was not a pretty pretty interview. Let's just put it that way. But uh, I think I'm a lot okay. of it you can... You understand and can get a sense of somebody just by their presence and the way that they're communicating with you. And so I think that was a big part of it. Wow. So you are off at school during the course of the day. What about your wife? What about Kristen? Yeah, so Kristen was at home with our eight eight month old daughter, and uh, immersing herself in the in the neighborhood. And so initially, when we moved, we thought that you know there'd be other moms like her staying staying at home with the kids, and she could relate to them. And but once we were there, we found that that really wasn't the case too much. Uh, a lot of the, the child rearing happened by the grandparents or they would be sent to a nursery from 8 a.m. to 5 or 6 sometimes, uh, starting when they were like 6 or 8 months old. And so it was that was a hard, hard thing for us to, to understand, but also for us to traverse as a family you know, because Kristen was pretty lonely at times, um, just being at home there and not having a lot of the language skills that she needed. So she would spend a lot of time um, working on her tie, a lot of time just, you know, engaging with our daughter and then just being out in the neighborhood trying to talk and meet people as, as she could during the days. So that was kind of the first year. Mm. Beyond that, once our language improved, um, she began to teach some English more in the afternoons, like in in, the, in our neighborhood, so with the kids in our neighborhood, and uh, and then we had more kids when we were there. So we had had one of our daughters born when we were in Thailand, which is a whole nother saga. But um, so it's just a lot of relationship building is essentially what she did. Wow! And how were you received? Were the people there receptive? Yeah, very much so. Um, so, well, I have two thoughts on that. So one is that once people got to know us, 
they're really receptive, really helpful, really excited that we were there to come and help uh, help the Thai people learn English and develop in that way. Uh, initially, and this is kind of a funny story, initially our English was not, our Thai was not good. So we would go to the, the markets and being the only foreign family with an eight-month-old who's blonde hair, blue eyes, we attract a lot of attention. And so people would point at us and whisper and we could hear them saying doll, uh, the Thai word for doll as we'd walk through a market or wherever. And uh, so they're referring to our daughter. But when I would go up or when my wife would go up to purchase some fruit or something like that, we noticed that the sellers were very reluctant to engage with us and to talk with us to the point that if there was a younger person there, they would push the younger person forward to have to talk to us um, so that they wouldn't have to. And at first I thought, you know, it kind of makes sense because... Uh, our tie is not good and sometimes I would mix up the word uh, name for the word urinate and so you know to their experience I would say things like hi I urinate Justin or hello what is your urinate um, so <laughs> makes sense mm -hmm. right you know they wouldn't necessarily want to put themselves in that awkward situation but as our tie improved uh, we realized that that didn't change much so they were still really reluctant and I was talking about this with one of our Thai friends and kind of trying to get his perspective on it. And he said, well, the reason that is, is because, you know, Thais learn English in school, starting in kindergarten, all the way through high school, it's required. Um, but they're not, they don't learn it very well. And so they're afraid that if they get into a conversation with you, even if you start speaking Thai, that you'll get to a place in the conversation where they have to use English and they will lose face in that conversation because they feel like they should know English better than they do. Which, you know, that was a surprise to us because we felt like we're in Thailand, yeah. we should be speaking Thai, right? And so we took the burden on us, but they they kind of felt like they should be able to speak English with us. Interesting. And interesting that they should call your daughter Doll. Yeah. Uh, what was that all about? Uh, I think it's just because they thought that she looked just like a baby doll you know, that they would, they would see in the stores or whatever. Oh, yeah. And not like a human. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Yeah. Well, so you, you cut your teeth, uh, as a missionary in Thailand and you practiced your hand at discipling, which we may go back to, but now the transition has been made. You come back after a number of years and your family has grown and now you're in Dayton, Ohio and, um, you can, train pastors and church leaders on disciple making in fact have just finished up a disciple making uh course or session or seminar i don't know you let me know what the, what it is and um pastors and churches are hungry to help in personal disciple making tell us about what you're doing now in Dayton. yeah so now i'm engaged uh, still with the navigators but it's a branch called the navigators church ministries and what we do is we come alongside pastors and church leaders to help them establish a culture of disciple making uh, within their church. And uh, this past Saturday, which you're referring to, we had a, a seminar here in Dayton, a uh, one-day seminar, where we had 10 churches from across uh, multiple denominations uh, come with their church leaders to learn about what does it mean to make disciples in a, in a personal way. Um, you know, as many of your listeners probably know, uh, the church is losing ground in America right now. So eight out of 10 churches, I just found uh, the statistic last week, uh, eight out of 10 churches are either declining or not growing at the same rate as their community. And so, you know, within our culture, we have a real challenge in front of us to, to you know, really embody the Great Commission to help people come to know Jesus and have a relationship with him. Um, and that starts with disciple making. Now, the other sad part about our current reality in America is that, you know, of the approximate 350,000 congregations, 81% uh, of them uh, self-report that they don't have an effective strategy for making disciples. And as I've been engaging, so I've been engaging with pastors and churches now for the past couple years. And as I've been sitting across from pastors, I asked them a couple questions pretty pretty quickly. 
one of them is, you know, what do you feel like the, the major goal or the major purpose of the church is? And almost to a person, to a pastor, everyone has said, you know, to make disciples. And so then I asked them, I said, well, how's it going for you in your church, you know, with making disciples? And so far, every pastor that I've talked to and had a conversation with about that has given me an answer that's been less than, less than neutral. So ranging from, well, we're really struggling uh, to, well, we're, we're almost at okay, but, you know, we're still have a lot to learn, a lot of ways to go in that. And so what, what our job is, is to come alongside pastors and churches and to kind of help with questions. So, you know, we have some experience as the navigators in personal disciple making, um, but we don't have all the answers. And, and so what we try to do is to come alongside pastors, ask lots of questions about, you know, what they're seeing in their church, the ways that uh, they're engaging the people that come and their communities, and how are they making disciples. So that's a big part of of uh, what we're doing now. And the goal is that, that a culture of disciple making is born into that church because, you know, some denominations, the pastors are moved around uh, as frequently as every five to seven years, sometimes even faster than that. And so if you're just mm -hmm. impacting the pastor, then when the next pastor comes through, you know, things can totally change and be different. And so our real heartbeat is to impact not just the pastor, not just the church leaders, but to establish a culture of uh, disciple making there where each each person or, or many people in the church um, have a ministry of their own where they're making disciples of, of those around them. Yes, and those around them do not include the people with whom they're worshiping. We're talking about people outside the church family, correct? Yeah, it's both and. So the ideal is that people that are not yet a part of the church community um, initially or at, at some points we're, we're surrounded by people oftentimes who are kind of spiritual orphans. And so, you know, Paul says to Timothy that, that he's his son and Second Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, Paul says to Timothy, and the things you have heard me say, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And so within that verse, there are four generations, right? So Paul is communicating to Timothy. Uh, Timothy is told to go out and entrust it to reliable men who will then go on to teach others. And what we see a lot of times is there are people that have been in the churches um, for decades, really, who have never been taught personally, how do I open up the Bible and have time in the Word with God in a way that feeds my soul? How do I pray in a way that, um, you know, I'm connecting with God and not just saying words that feel like they don't go past the ceiling? And so these are some of the concepts and these are some of the things that are involved in personal disciple making. And so when, when you have people in the churches who are so hungry for that type of help, if we can help some of them um, do some things that, you know, they've probably already heard, but they've just never seen it. And there's a disciple-making loop that a lot of times uh, we talk about and we engage in. Uh, and that is, and it goes like this, tell them why, show them how, get them started, keep them going, and help them pass it on. And so as you help believers learn that, then they can begin to go out and help others. And so what we want to be doing, and in my life and the guys that I train, uh, I try to help them to see that, you know, we should probably at, at all points in our life strive to have another Christian that we're helping to mature and non-believers, non-Christians who we're engaging with relationally and with the gospel and with the, the power of the word through prayer um, to help them come to know Jesus. And so in the churches, but that's you kind have, of what uh, we you, you found a way to do this, Justin Gravitt of the Navigators, and you've been with them for a long time. And I want to find out the hows of this mission to disciple on the other side of our break. So I hope to stick around to talk with me then. Great.
We'll be back with more Living the Word after this. Justin. Yes. Hey, this is great. Um, I'm I'm really liking this. Uh, so let's talk on the other side of the break about uh, how you were doing this. And you said that there was a uh, um, connection with Cleveland as well, right? Uh, we have a guy, yeah, who's just outside of Cleveland. I think he's in the... He's not far from Kent State, Akron area, somewhere in there. But I know he serves churches in Cleveland, too. Yeah, and so he's teaching them this discipleship method. Yep. Is yep. that right? Yes. <clears throat> okay, well, let's go into the nuts and bolts of what you're doing. It sounds like a, you know, I love talking about Thailand. I wish we could talk about it a whole hour, but... Yeah. <clears throat> pardon me. But this is um, this is where you want to go, so let's, um, let's go down this path, okay? Okay, sounds great. All right. Um, I'll listen to the music, and I'll invite you back, and we'll pick it up here on... Uh, in just a moment. Okay. Here we go. Welcome back to Living the Word. I'm John Laughman, and Navigators, about which we've been speaking, has been around for a long time. 1933 is when it began, and it's now reached to the point where it's serving uh, more than 100 countries across planet Earth. But right here in our own country, we have people who need to learn how to make disciples within their own churches, pastors, church leaders. And I'm talking with Justin Gravitt, who has a long history with the Navigators, who served in Thailand, who now is back in the States, living in Dayton, and he is helping those pastors and church leaders disciple within their own churches and outside their own churches, building the kingdom of God in the Great Commission. And Justin, you were outlining four different ways that you go about helping pastors and church leaders to make disciples. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of this because there's a real need that you've discovered and the pastors and church leaders have come to you and said, how can we do this more effectively? So share with us on the air what you're doing to help these pastors and churches. And I know that we spoke off air about the fact that there is a an outreach here in the Northeast Ohio area as well. So how do you do it? How do you do it, Justin? How yes. do you make more disciples through pastors and church leaders? Yeah, so with churches, one of the things that, you know, we do is we begin with the pastor and his staff. Uh, a lot of pastors, you know, they've been to seminary, and I've been asking pastors I've been working with what their training was like in seminary in terms of personal disciple making. And I've yet to have a pastor tell me that they had a class, that they had anything intentional as far as their training in personal disciple making. Um, so for most pastors, this is a new area. Uh, it's an area where um, it happens in a life-on-life -life way, and so it's it's different from you know what they normally do as far as their their preparations for sermons, their uh, hospital visitations, things like that. And so what we're really talking about is a paradigm shift that many pastors have to go through. And the paradigm shift is you know one way to characterize it or to think about it is a move from seeing themselves as a shepherd of the sheep uh, to seeing themselves more primarily as a as a trainer of people and a developer of people. And those certainly aren't mutually exclusive, uh, but as far as the dominant paradigm shift, that, that normally is what we uh, help them to, to move through. And so in a church setting, we will spend, you know, six months to a year uh, working just individually with a pastor or with the pastor and his staff, having lots of conversations, modeling, 
um, answering questions about what this might look like, establishing trust with the pastor. And after the pastor seems to have a handle on it and, and really develop some convictions scripturally about personal disciple making, then they're really interested and hungry in seeing that impact their church as well. And so the next step of the process is to help the, the church leaders. So the pastor would select, you know, eight to ten church leaders across generations within his, um, within his congregation, both genders represented, and we begin to help those people in the same way so that really those people are the ones who are going to model uh, to the broader church community what does it look like to live the life of a, of a disciple. What are the things that are involved? And so they become an, an incarnational, incarnational example in their congregation where uh, other people look to them and they say, you know, I, I think I'd like to be like that. I think I'd like to know how to share my faith. I think I'd like to really understand how to get in the Word and to study it and to help other people. And so through that, and we've been talking about culture change a little bit, so through that, culture begins to develop. And culture is really made up of things like shared language, shared values, shared stories and practices, kind of a vision for uh, who they are and who they want to be. And so that, the seeds of that really get planted within that first group of, of people, eight to ten church leaders there. And as they model that and move that out into the broader church community, then they begin to think and wrestle with, well, what does this look like in, our, in the community of which we live, in our neighborhoods, in our city? How, how can we engage those around us? You know, something interesting is that among 18 to 29-year-olds in America right now, uh, they are twice as likely to be atheists than they are to be evangelical. And among the same age group, 18 to 29, they are four to six times more likely to be secularist, so atheist, agnostic, or non-religious, than they are to be uh, evangelical or have a relationship with Christ. And, and so we really have to do a better job of engaging the communities and neighborhoods around us. And so we help churches begin to develop a plan and, and equip them to do that well. And as they engage in that way, we begin to see new Christ followers come into the church community. And from there, new leaders begin to emerge out of that. And so we kind of see kind of a circular pattern happen over the course of time. Now this is, John, this is not a fast process. This is not a, a microwave approach to disciple making. This is more of a crock pot. And so this whole process could take three, about three years, three to five years sometimes, <laughs> Uh, but we're really looking at how are we going to be faithful to the call that, that Christ has given us to make disciples and to first be the kind of, di the kind of follower uh, that the world needs more of because essentially we are reproducing ourselves and our own faith uh, in that. So that's kind of a brief sketch of big picture, 30,000 foot view of what we're doing uh, with pastors and churches right now. Yeah, and it's a great overview. And you've just finished up in Dayton with uh, a weekend of, well, bringing 10 pastors or so and church leaders together in order to, what, initiate this? Uh, so that, that seminar was um, in part uh, initiating, but more of it was with pastors and churches we were already working with uh, in the Dayton area. And so to bring them together, and we had uh, different navigator staff from all over our region come in and do workshops uh, along the, the topics related to disciple making. And so we had you know, about 60, 65 people that were part of that. It's the first time we've done it in this area. And so we were really excited about uh, the people that were able to come. We also engaged uh, four new churches as a result of them hearing about this happening and, and wanting to be a part of it. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a tremendous time um, collecting feedback now through an online survey, and it seems like people really benefited from that this weekend. So if I understand you correctly, you brought in people who are part of the Navigators and that ministry, 
which again has a long history, and you brought them together for a one-day seminar to help get the ball rolling within a number of churches and kind of give them a little bit of an overview in a seminar. Was it courses? Was it classes? Is there instructional material involved? How do you how do you initiate that? I mean, are there pastors there and church leaders taking copious notes on what is being said? And how can this grow? And uh, I'd love to see it happen in Northeast Ohio. And you say that possibility uh, exists. So tell us what went on this past yeah. weekend. Okay. So it was a workshop-based um, day of training. So we had seven workshops total, of which each participant could choose two of them to engage in throughout the day. And so our morning workshops uh, were an hour and 45 minutes long. Uh, some of the topics, so our, our regional team here, so we're part of the Great Lakes region, and our regional team, we have um, guys who have been on Navigator staff for 40 years. We have other guys who uh, are former pastors who were in the pastorate for decades uh, and who now are retired from the pastorate, but now are engaged in helping other pastors in the ways that we've been talking about. And um, and myself, former missionary, a guy who's been making disciples in different contexts as well. But So some of the, the things that, some of the workshops, um, one of them was called the life, the Lifestyle and Impact of a Disciple-Making Pastor. Uh, another one was called How Do We Develop Convictions in Young Disciples. Uh, another one was called the Disciple-Maker's Toolbox. Another one was the Intricate Art of Discipling Women. Uh, another one was... Uh, the Disciple Maker's Secret Weapon. And so that kind of gives you a flavor of some of the workshops, what, what they were about, how we engaged. And so there was a morning session, afternoon session. Uh, there were handouts, all that sort of stuff. But also over lunch, we had, um, we had kind of an overview of our process and how we engage churches, how people could get engaged in this and involved. Um, for your listeners, you know, whether you're a church leader, whether you're... Um, just a new parishioner at a church, or whether you're a pastor, um, you know we want to serve and to help churches that have have an itch that need to be scratched in this area. And so, a way that they could connect would be to hop onto our website, navigatorschurchministries.org. So again, that's navigatorschurchministries.org. If that's too long, they could just go to navigators.org, and you can poke around there and find a link to our particular branch. Um, but we are really excited and, and encouraged by the doors that God is opening, um, not only in Ohio, but across the nation. So we're starting to see some denominations hear about what we're doing and have approached the navigators at a denominational level and have said, hey, would you come and help us you know, around the country as a denomination? figure out how to do a little little more of an effective job at making disciples and establishing disciple-making cultures in the churches within our denomination. And so I know these, these conversations, John, are happening at, at levels that are much higher than where I'm at uh, within the organization. But right now we have a partnership with the North American Lutheran Church denomination uh, throughout the country and we're in uh, conversation with several others that you know your listeners would be more familiar with probably or that are a little bit larger. Um, but so we're really excited about the way that God is moving. And you know our goal and you know myself being a former overseas missionary, and my heartbeat is the nations. And so as I engage with churches, one, one of the things that motivates me is I look at the nations and I see the tremendous need, for people to uh, to hear about the gospel, to hear about Christ. And most of our churches right now, um, from all the statistics that I'm seeing and from what I'm experiencing on the ground here in Dayton, uh, are not in a place of tremendous health or fruitfulness. Uh, certainly there are those churches out there. Um, but so many churches uh, need help of this kind. And, you know, we're, we're here to serve and we're here to come alongside in, in the ways that we can offer whatever experience and things that we have learned. Uh, we want to do that so that, you know, each and every church um, can be a sending church and can be a church that is actively and vibrantly engaging not only the community around them, but also nations, you know, across the globe. 
So this disciple making, is this something that if it's caught the ear of a church leader or a pastor right here, they can say, I'm going to go to navigators.org and find out more about how I can bring this team uh, from navigators into my church and maybe some other churches in my area. Is that basically the thing that you're trying to initiate? Sure. Yep. Yep. So if they just went to navigators.org or navigatorchurchministries.org, there is a place where you can send an, an email contact and someone who will be in touch with you uh, to talk further about how what your needs are, first of all, because, you know, we we don't go into a church with the answers and say, here's what we do in every church. We talk uh, and try to figure out where the needs are, and then we try to help figure out well, what would be appropriate in helping. And so that process would be initiated through the website, through an email, and then somebody would be uh, would get in touch with that person and, and continue the conversation from there. Mm. And the seminar that you just conducted here over the past weekend, are you going to have a follow-up? Are you going to get these folks back together in you know, six weeks, in you know a month, whatever, to you know follow through on what they've done and to kind of give each other a little bit of feedback and help bolster them some more, give them some more food? Yes. So the the pastors that were there, the churches that were represented, uh, are churches all within the Dayton area, and I'm the the staff here in the Dayton area. So I'll be connecting with each and every one of those. Uh, within the next month, and continuing to follow up with them, and so the the work, the nature of our work is really relational. Uh, it's personal, and so um, you know, as people come and connect with us, really, it's a relationship that begins. And so I'll be continuing those relationships and uh, beginning those that uh, that I that began on Saturday. The few of them that I didn't know, and uh, continuing to help, continuing to serve. So the follow-up is one-on-one -on -one with you or someone from your team going back to the church or the church leader and helping them grow. And uh, are you uh, available if they come across come to some kind of a roadblock or a place where they need to make a decision and need some, uh, some valued um, encouragement or direction? Yes. Yep. So the, as an example of kind of how relationships work, uh, with the pastors and the navigator staff is, you know, as I engage with most of the pastors that, that I'm relating with right now, I'm engaged with them every other week, uh, normally sitting sitting down with them for an hour, two hours, talking about their life, how their relationship with Christ is going, but also how things are going at a ministry level. So, you know, our relationships are not just professional in nature, uh, they're personal. And so, you know, we're involved in one another's lives. Uh, one pastor I'm working with, he and his family just had twins uh, a week and a half ago. And the day after, I was in the hospital room with, with he and his wife and just talking about how it went and, you know, just relating, living life together uh, as much as we possibly can. But, um, you know, outside of that, too, we're also uh, engaging with um, people who who are involved in churches and helping them to grow uh, as well. So, Well, I'm talking to Justin Gravitt. He's with Navigators, and he's part of a group that includes the Great Lakes region and part of a group that is trying to help church leaders and pastors disciple others. Uh, Justin, you said the Great Lakes region is your region. Is there a counterpart to you here in Northeast Ohio in Cleveland? Yes, there's a guy just outside of Cleveland, Dane Alfin, um, who's serving up in that region. And I know he's engaging with, with a lot of churches. Um, some, he's just outside of Cleveland, but I know that, that a couple of the churches that he's even currently engaged with are in the Cleveland area there. And so doing the same thing that you're doing in Dayton, yep. pulling these pastors and church leaders together to help them make disciples. So do you have another seminar coming up? Do you happen to know what's going on in this region that folks might be able to engage in, become participants in? Yeah, there's there's not a current seminar on the calendar right now for that region. Um, but I know Dane is, is always kind of has his antenna up for churches that are really hungry and looking for help in those areas. And so, again, I direct people that are interested in, in further engagement to the website. 
uh, and then I know Dane could could follow up with them from there. There's some really interesting statistics that you threw out about particularly young people and the fact that there are fewer and fewer of them that are walking with the Lord and so many of them that are just going to places that um, include atheism, which yeah. is very disheartening. Yes. Is, do, you, do you see that being overcome? Do you, I mean, it's a challenge out there for us, and uh, I know that you're trying to address that challenge, but do you see a future? Yes, absolutely. Um you know, I think the gospel, uh, sometimes we view cultural forces as a threat. Uh, but as I'm, I've studied church history and, you know, I've read scholars that have done a lot of work in that, it seems like the gospel uh, thrives in places that are harsh uh, from cultural forces and cultural levels. And so it is disheartening sometimes and discouraging to see some of the, the choices that are being made or some of the, the ways that our culture is moving um, but at the same time, I believe that the gospel shines even more brightly uh, in a culture where there's a lot of darkness. And so I think that that there is hope uh, and that we, as as disciples of Christ, that as we continue to, to get to know Jesus, that we become mature in our faith, that we take seriously the call to go and make disciples, uh, that each and every one of us can be a part of of the solution of helping people come to know him and seeing their lives, their lives changed. Well, in the first part of our conversation, Justin, you were telling us that you're a graduate of Miami University, and um, I know a little about that. I have uh, three graduates, and one of whom, uh, you know, my son, Andrew, mm -hmm. who is with Navigators. So have you gone back? Because the, the campus of Miami University in Oxford is not that far from Dayton. Have you gone back to see how the navigators uh, are doing on the campus of Miami? Because this is a, a place where you're talking about the age group that you just addressed. Right. Yes. Yeah, I have. Um, I guess the last time was probably two to three years ago. But I spent some time with the, the leader of that group. Uh, it was probably around Thanksgiving uh, and spent a few hours with him. And from, from what he said and his wife said, Things are going well uh, overall. There is more, more and more of a pronounced divide uh, amongst those who are interested in, in spiritual things and interested in learning about Christ and the Word of God and those who aren't. Um, but there's certainly no shortage of people who are seeking to engage with Christ. And the other thing that they're, they're seeing is that amongst those who are not initially interested uh, as they go through life on the college campus, um, they're really experiencing the darkness of, of doing life without Christ. And so the hunger spiritually uh, over time with certain individuals is certainly growing, and their openness continues to grow in that way. Um, so, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And to think about the campus is a lot of times it's the future of our culture. And so the cultures that are happening there you know, we can kind of look at as kind of a microcosm of what's coming in our in our greater culture here. So, yeah, and it's very fertile ground, college campuses. And I know navigators are very active, or the navigators, the organization is very active on lots of college campuses. Yep. Because you know, kids are looking for who they are. They're trying to put an identity to themselves. It goes beyond their parents and their families, they're trying to become their own people. And part of that is defining your values and your beliefs. And one place that uh, those are honed or developed or even initiated are college campuses. And this is the group that you were talking about earlier is so not only ripe, but so diverse in that many of them are just simply moving away from, uh, from the Lord or they've never experienced him or they're becoming on fire, and uh, the middle ground is becoming thinner and thinner. Right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so where do you see this going, the discipleship? Where, where, what is your hope? What is, what is on the horizon for you as a person who trains pastors and church leaders in disciple-making? Where do you see it going? Yeah, my hope and, and kind of vision here in, in the Dayton area is that, that pastors and churches um, – 
really begin to establish those cultures of disciple making and that we begin to see a movement of disciple makers within the Dayton area. And so wouldn't it be amazing if every person had a neighbor who was a trained and equipped disciple of Jesus Christ? That, you know, when, when you know, thinking about the snow that fell this past week, uh, when the elderly think about, you know, their driveway that they can't shovel, or the, you know, in our area we have a lot of military, uh, some of whom are deployed right now, and so to have a neighbor to come come across the street and to shovel shovel the driveway and help out in tangible tangible ways, but also be equipped and able to communicate from an experiential level about their their relationship with Jesus. Uh, just what a huge difference that would make. And I think those statistics that I referenced before about the movement of our culture and and beliefs, I think a big part of the problem is, you know, people see a lot of Christians and they just look at it as, well, you have different beliefs than I do. We all have beliefs, you know, whatever. But I really believe in the power of incarnation, right? If we can incarnate our faith and the life of Christ in us, what a huge difference that makes that people can see the difference and not just think it's an academic or, um, you know, an understanding type thing, but they can see man, it really does make a difference in everyday life. And so that's kind of what, what my vision is for the Dayton area and beyond, that, that our country begins to be marked more and more by effective disciple makers. Yeah, and that's the vision of all of us. We want to make sure that more disciples are made so that the kingdom continues to grow. Justin Amen. Gravit, thank you so much. I'm grateful for your time and your efforts on our behalf, the kingdom's behalf, through the Navigators. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. And friends, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in everything you do, disciple, making, or otherwise, please continue living the Word. Hey, Justin. Yeah. You are a very articulate man. Hey, and, thank and, you. And um, really love chatting with you. Hope we can continue to build the kingdom up here and across the globe. But uh, I appreciate your efforts greatly. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And if you're looking, you know, sometime down the road, I know you guys do this often. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Dane sometime to hear more locally what he could talk about, just let me know.